the wireless. Yeah. Yeah, it's it says it can't go live. So, so let's uh, sit a little bit. So just um, allow yourself to sit in a comfortable, comfortable way, in a comfortable position, uh, and then uh, I will do, I will say a few words. Uh, if you find it useful, uh, then take them. But if you already have your way of um, sitting meditation, then uh, we're not yet doing specifically the, uh, compassion and the kindness uh, meditations that, uh, we're gonna, that we're going to uh, focus on this weekend. Uh, so here is just taking some moments uh, to settle down and to be quiet. Instead of thinking of this meditation or this sitting as doing something, relate to this as undoing rather than doing. You can perhaps think of this as allowing body and mind to settle into their own places. Let body settle into its own place and let mind, let each moment of awareness or consciousness also settle into its own place. You might then begin first by gently and slowly allow your body to settle into its own place. So feel around the body and see if there's any place needs slight adjustment, adjustment to simply let it settle into its own place. Try not to have any big abrupt movements, but rather slowly, subtly adjusting. Note anywhere on the body that might be tense or tight, as well as note anywhere in the body that might be open and spacious and at ease. If there is tightness or tension, a 
observe that, and observe that. Simply observe that, and then breathe in, and imagine directing your breath to that specific spot. Imagining breath loosening up the tension, the tightness, and then breath taking whatever tightness and entanglement in that specific spot or area. And like a vacuum, sucking that tension out and releasing them from you. Let your senses clear and vivid, no need to block, no need to take special effort to block the functioning of your five senses. At the same time, do not let sensory experiences drag you around. Not let your mental chatter drag you around either. No need to feed it. No need to feed sensory experiences. But also no need to inhibit functioning of the senses. And using your mind to allow your body to settle into its own place, you'll find your mind or the mind moments of awareness and consciousness to also start to settle into their own places. From moment to moment to moment, every moment its own moment, every moment that arises ceases. And all we have to do is to be present, to turn up for just one moment, and again turn up for another moment, and another moment, and another moment. Each moment fresh, each moment unencumbered, Each moment in constant, each moment not self, not I, not me, not mine. Find it helpful, you can place your attention on the rhythm of your breath. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Perhaps at the beginning, you might try to control this. Slow, deliberate breaths. Inhale. 
exhale. Inhale. Exhale. But mainly, just let breath be regular. And just observe the comings and goings of each breath. Just turn up and be present for each breath, for each moment.
So this morning, uh, we began by looking at what I would say to be sort of not so much the content per se of what we have uh, decided we'll do this weekend, but uh, very important, I think, how we approach the content. How we go from listening to contemplating and then to meditating. I think um, if we miss that, um, then we don't know how to connect the three and we don't know how to listen or how to study, how to learn. And then we don't really do the contemplating and then we think oh, we're doing the meditating then we're not sure what we're meditating on. <laughs> and, uh, it doesn't work that, that well. Uh, so I think uh, then importantly to well, most of us, you know, all of us, uh, most of us have enough Dharma knowledge and information. So we don't really need more. Maybe what we need is how to start re-hearing, re-listening, re-studying what we already have, and then how to bring that into uh, the contemplation part, and how through that contemplation it will give us something uh, to meditate on meaning to familiarize ourselves with. So meditation uh, is also a process um, of familiarizing, to acquaint, to get acquainted with. In that sense, uh, we are already doing meditation. We've been meditating since we were born and even in past lifetimes, meaning uh, familiarization but so far we have been familiarizing uh, in a neurotic <laughs> uh, familiarizing um, kind of causes of suffering uh, and getting dragged around by that there is a there are some people uh, with you know good reason that they have gathered together to say that actually we don't want to be rid of suffering. <laughs> Maybe there's some truth to that. That we actually prefer to suffer. Uh, because we don't know the alternative. So that's why we cannot be free from suffering. Because fundamentally we don't want to be free from suffering. We just don't like the, the inconveniences that suffering causes from time to time. Then only in those moments we say, oh, you know, I want to be free from suffering. But in fact, fundamentally, there's a school of thought, not, not Buddhism, just in general, that says, no, human beings you know, like suffering. They can't do without it. <laughs> but I don't know if I'll agree that that is innate, would say that that could be so habitualized that uh, so we've meditated so well neurosis and suffering that it's hard to have any trust that when you take away the neurosis and the suffering you won't be annihilated <laughs> won't turn into a vegetable. I think people on some level, not rational perhaps, this, this fear that if I gave up those things, I'll just cease to exist. And that's terrifying. But the Buddha said, no, that's not the case. That in fact suffering is uh, a pervasive experience, a pervasive 
state of existence that all of us are caught up in, stuck in, controlled by. But it's not innate to any of us. It's a mistake. A mistake in the sense of not, oh, you are a bad person, you have made a mistake. A mistake in the sense of it has no basis and therefore it should not be. It is not the case that it is so e so difficult to be done with it. So actually, yeah, it's, it's not so difficult. And yet it is difficult. It's not so difficult because it has no basis to it. Uh, it's a mistake. Uh, it's an error. Uh, and so it has no foundation to it. And so it can fall apart fairly easily. Uh, then of course it can also reappear very easily. So when we say that Buddha Shakyamuni became awake, then he put an end to it so that it doesn't keep coming back. But for us, before we actually get to that, it is possible to also experience momentarily how the entanglements and the suffering can kind of die, you know, die down and have that experience of ease and comfort and satisfaction. And so it's possible to experience that momentarily and then have kind of suffering or annoyance or neurosis and flare up again. But we should not think that you know until we are like that, we have no possibility of experiencing uh, freedom from dukkha, freedom from suffering. And so, uh, what we're going to look at this weekend, it's kindness, which is maitri or metta, uh, compassion, caring, which is karuna, and then the third is bodhicitta, uh, the awakened heart or the awakening heart, awaken, awakening, bodhi. Actually, the etymology of Bodhi, meaning of Bodhi, uh, doesn't have much to do with the image of light. <laughs> the early Victorian translators of Buddhism into English adopted the light imager. So then enlightenment became uh, common as the word for Bodhi. Bodhi means waking up. Um, so bodhicitta, the body mind, the awakening mind, the awakened mind. So these are the three, uh, three kind of uh, elements that we can look at uh, for the rest of today and uh, tomorrow as well. Mm, so having uh, spent the morning uh, talking about the limits of words particularly the print of words and text and analyzing text and all of that. Of course, that's just, you know, an excuse. Now we're going to start analyzing text. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at words, splicing words, you know, milking some meaning out of the words. I always like to point out and say that the Chan or Zen tradition in East Asia as one of its hallmarks, one of its like uh, self-representation is found
scriptures. Next line is fully Wenzi. Not establishing, not dependent on words and letters. So that's that's their self-representation. Then if you take a survey of um, literature that has been produced by the different groups of Buddhists in East Asia, the largest chunk comes from the Zen tradition. Voluminous. <laughs> to no end. They produce all these words. <laughs> and words and more words and more words and more words. And this is not hypocrisy. This is not contradiction. This is sort of that creative tension again. Another aspect of that creative tension. So we should only play with these words or spend so much time with the words if we understand or if we get it that we do not rely on the words but we rely on the meaning of the words. Then when we go to the words we can derive meaning from the words. So pay attention to the words but don't get tied up and entangled by the words. And so, uh, there is a short handout uh, that we made copies. This is uh, four verses, 16 lines. 16 lines from the opening of an important Indian Buddhist text known as Entering the Middle Way, Madhyamaka Avatara. A kind of scholastic work. It's a text composed by an Indian Buddhist master called Chandrakirti. Chandra means moon. Kirti is like discernment. Kind of a beautiful name. The discerning moon. <laughs> we tend to maybe associate discernment with the sun. Bright, clear sunlight that gives rise to discernment. Chandakirti's discernment is a soft, is a discernment that is illuminated by the soft, cooling light of the moon, particularly of the full moon. When there is a full moon in the sky, when there is no light pollution from the city, if you are out in, in the rural area, the whole night is illuminated with this soft, cool light, and you can see everything when there is no light pollution. So his name even could milk some meaning. <coughs> that point us to a kind of discernment that we should you know, seek. It's a discernment which is cool, which is soft, but illuminating. So that's his name, Chandrakirti. Uh, so he wrote this text called Madhyamaka Avatar. He lived in the 9th century. So maybe let's together say these 16 lines in four verses once. <coughs> Shravakas and intermediate Buddhas are born from the mighty sages, and the fully awakened Buddhas are born from the Bodhisattvas. A compassionate mind, understanding of non-duality, and bodhicitta, these are the causes of the victor's errors. Love is the seed of this abundant harvest of Buddhahood. It is like the water which causes growth and expansion, and it ripens into the state of lasting enjoyment. Therefore, at the outset, I shall praise compassion. Firstly, with the thought of I, they cling to self, 
and then with mine they grow attached to things. Helplessly they wander like a turning water wheel. To compassion for these beings I bow down. Beings are like the moon in rippling water, fitful, fleeting, empty in their nature. Bodhisattvas see them thus and yearn to set them free. Their minds come under the power of compassion. A little bit more about Chandakirti and the particular Buddhist tradition that he was committed to. He is often placed in the same lineage, if we want to call it that, the same kind of family as Nagarjuna, uh, Aryadeva, and so on so forth and Shantideva as well. So he is said then, said then to belong to this group of Indian Buddhists who saw themselves as followers of a particular uh, tradition uh, that calls itself uh, the followers of the middle way. Now of course they are rather immodest <laughs> because for a long time that designation followers of the middle way is basically the general term uh, that Buddhists of all forms can refer to themselves or understand themselves to be doing because the Buddha said I taught the middle way I teach the middle way but then, at some point in, in the history of Indian Buddhism, a distinctive group emerged by identifying themselves as followers of the Middle Way. And in particular, they all look to Nagarjuna's composition called Root Verses of the Middle Way. The root fundamental verses of the middle way. Mula Madhyamaka Karika. That's a mouthful. <laughs> the root verses of the middle way. The fundamental verses of the middle way. So Nagarjuna uh, is often credited as one of the key figures in the Mahayana movement. In the movement of the great Bihar course his history and his historicity is all shrouded in mystery you know exactly who was this person when he lived all that is still being debated of course tradition assigns a particular period of time for him and all of that and at least within Mahayana circles um, he is often referred to as the second Buddha so so his kind of status stature in the Mahayana great vehicle tradition uh, is second only to uh, the founder. So Chandakirti, when he wrote this, uh, at least I would say five, six centuries after Nagarjuna, and called his text Entering the Middle Way, the immediate reference to this middle way is actually the middle way, the root verses of the middle way, and not generally the Buddhist path. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that that layer of meaning is also there. And of course, it wants to claim that you know this represents kind of like the 
an, an entry into what is at the center, what is at the heart, what is at the middle of the Buddha's teachings, which Nagarjuna saw what he was doing as, as that, as re kind of bringing into focus what was lost between the Buddha's time and his time in terms of what was at the center, what was at the heart of the Buddha's vision, the Buddha's approach, the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha's method. So Nagarjuna saw himself as you could say maybe retrieving that, this archaeology of meanings that he was engaged in. Uh, and and, and on, the, on the mythic level, it says that he uh, was led by these Nagas, these subterranean uh, uh, spirits, into the realm of Nagas, whereby they have these uh, texts of the Mahayana Sutras that he was then given and then he brought them back from this watery world of the subterranean spirits, the Nagas, mm -hmm. who, who guarded them uh, uh, until the time was right for someone like Nagarjuna to re-illuminate sort of the Buddha's uh, fundamental vision. And so goes the story. More than one way, Nagarjuna is seen as kind of retrieving, bringing back what has been submerged, literally or metaphorically, however you want to look at it, since at least four or five hundred years after the historical Buddha passed. So Chandakirti's text, Entering the Middle Way, deals with that. Now, this tradition called the Madhyamaka, Middle Way school or the Middle Way tradition. Uh, those of you who are familiar with this would, would immediately think of wisdom. And in fact, they are, it's said that they are, what they consider to be the root, uh, the source of their, those teachings is called the perfection of wisdom scriptures, which is supposedly what was brought back from the subterranean world. Nagarjuna's uh, retrieval were retrieving these texts. And so the perfection of wisdom um, is basically that which needs to be uh, achieved in order to become awake. A, a Buddha is awake in that it has awoken in, in that it is now perfected wisdom. So then, uh, often we think, you know, the Madhyamaka tradition is about uh, the wisdom aspect. But interestingly, uh, in this text, and that's why I chose the 16 lines, uh, we see that at the very beginning of this text, as uh, paying homage, as the opening, Chandakirti immediately focuses on what? Compassion. To compassion for these beings, I bow down. So that's, that's the main kind of point. And then in that section, those, those uh, last two verses there, <coughs> those last eight lines, he uh, begins to kind of uh, parse out uh, three types of compassion. And then in the verse before that, the second verse, he talks about love. Now this is again kind of interesting. Uh, in the traditional commentaries, that I have access to, not too many, but enough to kind of note that all the commentators just take this word love as synonymous with compassion. 
And of course, in the end, you know, they, they are definitely linked, these two. Love or metta and karuna are definitely linked. As they say, you know, there are no, na there are no lines in nature. <laughs> lines are artificial. It's, it's a grid that we, we you know, map onto nature to help us organize the unruliness of life. Likewise, the Dharma teachings uh, seem to have all these lines and boxes. But if we know how to relate to the lines and boxes to, to know that this is just frameworks uh, that temporarily impose upon real life, real experiences, real challenges, real realizations. And, and that lines and boxes are all language of the path not language of the goal. And sometimes when we learn so much about the path, the ins and the outs of the path, we, 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 we mistakenly think that all these definitions, all these lines, all these delineations, you know, 1.4, 1.3, are part of like the fruit. No, the fruit, you just taste directly. <laughs> language of the path, language of the method for ease intended that way but then sometimes we get all tangled up so three types of compassion that we will look at love somehow <coughs> suddenly gets introduced in the second verse if you look at the first verse it says a compassionate mind understanding of non-duality and bodhicitta these are the causes of bodhisattvas. And then the next verse, love is the seed. You're like, wait. And all the teachers and college professors here, if you were grading Chandakirti, you're like, <laughs> bad writing. Unless love is a synonym for compassion. And like I said, the commentaries that I've seen mostly gloss it over as, yes, 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 that's just another word for compassion. But I want to kind of suggest the, uh, that there might be some benefit to kind of treat love there as love and distinct from compassion. That there might be a useful purpose. So we can look at that and see if, if that's the case. Now, the title of this retreat, um, Kindness, which is another word for metta, but, and then we'll talk about metta more, is actually goodwill, friendliness, loving kindness, along those lines. That's metta, my tree. So in the tradition uh, that I'm most familiar with, uh, we say that in order to cultivate the uh, bodhi, uh, cultivate bodhicitta, the awakened heart, you first begin with meditating on metta, then cultivating metta, then cultivating karuna, then upon the basis of cultivating metta and karuna, then you can cultivate one aspect of bodhicitta, which is the aspect of making that aspiration to commit to waking up, to commit to becoming Buddha for the benefit of all. That's only one aspect of bodhicitta. So when we get to bodhicitta, we'll talk more about, we'll, we'll learn more about bodhicitta, which again, I think many of you already know. But this one aspect of bodhicitta then is the aspiration, the vow, the desire, the intention to commit to waking up, becoming Buddha, for the benefit of all. 
That's one aspect of the awakened mind, of the Bodhi heart. The other kind of aspect of Bodhi heart is the wisdom aspect, and the more explicitly wisdom aspect. So that's how we got the title of this retreat, and pointing to these three elements. But here, uh, these elements are all there, but configured differently. Figure it a little differently. So again, you know, I think what I'm trying to show here is that um, if you are trying to get them all to fit together in a rigid way, then you have to do a lot of kind of mental gymnastics. But if you remember that it was a few hundred years before any of these teachings were written down so that you can start comparing this book and this book and this book and this book, then, then I think I think we get more of a feel of, you know, how for the first few hundred years, how the Dharma is communicated to people. So, the first verse, Shravakas <coughs> intermediate with this, are born from the mighty sages. Mighty sages are Buddhists. Fully awakened Buddhists are the mighty sages mentioned here in the, in the second line. Are born from bodhisattvas. Okay, so now we have again some terms to define. There are shravakas and there are intermediate Buddhists. And then there are fully awakened Buddhists. So these are three classes three types of, uh, I guess you could call them saints, or three types of uh, sublime beings found in uh, ancient Buddhist texts. That any of these three are said to be free, to be liberated from suffering. So the most famous type with Siddhartha as the prototype, uh, what's known as fully awakened Buddhists. Those who then became awake by becoming his disciples are what's known as the Shravakas. Shravakas means the hearers, the auditors. It doesn't mean the auditors, no homework to do. <laughs> uh, it means that they heard the Buddha teach. And by hearing the Buddha teach, they then awoke. They woke up. So in fact, in the life story of the historical Buddha, people were like waking up left and right. It was like, you know, uh, 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 old time Bible revival <laughs> you know, like folks are getting saved left and right and up and down and slain by the spirit uh, and so that was sort of happening you know, when Buddha was around it's, it even seemed like wait, there is not much practice going on people were just getting awake by simply the words of the Buddha you know, so these were all the hearers that woke up So Shravakas then primarily refer to those immediate disciples. Then of course later after Buddha passed away, uh, it said that there are still Shravakas and those who heard the teachings that were heard, that were heard and that were heard and woke up, woke up. So not just disciples, but disciples who have woken up. Then intermediate Buddhas are also more commonly called solitary Buddhas, Pratyeka Buddhas. Take up with this are those who they are solitary in the sense that they woke up not at least in that lifetime that they woke up there were no um, formal instruction in Buddhist teachings 
but through the power of their, of course, merit, but through the power of their merit and their own observation of simply nature, not just trees, <laughs> but by observing existence, by observing life, they, they arrived at the same kind of waking up, and then they became free from entanglement. The hearers heard the formal teachings of the Buddha, whether from the Buddha's mouth or a few generations later, and all those who woke up that way, they are called hearers. Then those who woke up without relying on explicit formal teachings that you trace to the Buddha and his successors, they are called the intermediate Buddhas in this case, the middling Buddhas. Scholars say that this was some way along the way, or rather this category kind of got introduced or was, was necessarily had to exist to emphasize that, you know, what Buddhas realize uh, is, is how things are. And so that whether you have direct instruction from within the tradition or not, you still have access to it. Because if it is true, then whether you are told it or not, whether you instructed it or not, if you have the right circumstance, you will arrive at the same conclusion. So that's, that's how this kind of second category came into existence, uh, as, as a category. Again, categories are all right, just maps, right? just structure that we impose to, to help to give rise to some understanding. So, to, so don't get too stuck. Like when you get to awakening, on the other side of awakening, don't go there and go. So uh, where are the middling Buddhas seated? <laughs> what section do I check in at? You know, <laughs> the, the penthouse suites is where all the fully awakened Buddhas are. You know, <laughs> and the middling suites is where all the solitary Buddhas, but solitary, so they're not going to hang out with others. <laughs> They are also solitary, they say, because also because they lack, because they didn't arrive at the state of waking up through like more systematic instruction, they also don't necessarily have the skill or the karmic connection to beings so that they can communicate what they have woken up to, to others. So there's a slight sense of limitation. But, but in the early sources, it seems to say that, but insofar as the question of getting entangled and therefore suffer, all three of these are free from entanglements. Now, later Mahayana tradition is, to, is going to say, and it's not our business, we don't need to get into it, I'm just going to point out, later Mahayana traditions are going to say, no, 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 the only one that is truly free are the fully. Uh, these other two, they still have work to do. Yes or not, who knows? You know. mm -hmm. If you get there, please come tell us. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't uh, the Srivaka, I keep thinking about the Heart Sutra. Uh-huh. He's in the Heart Sutra. So, I mean, not he, Shravakas, uh, any and all the Buddha's disciples who heard his teachings and okay, became awake. I always think of yeah. Shariputra. Yeah, that's Shariputra. Shariputra. Oh, and Shariputra yeah. was a Shravaka. Okay. He heard. Yeah, he was yeah. a hearer. Yeah. So these are the hearers the auditors. Didn't pay full tuition, so didn't get the whole package. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had a pretty good. <laughs> um, so, so, so what Chandakirti is doing here is that, you know, he's using these terms that his audience would say, oh wow, these are, these are amazing beings. Uh, these are sublime beings. Shravakas and intermediate Buddhas. You see, you have to kind of appreciate why he used these two. Uh, post Mahayana, or after Mahayana became big and all of that, uh, people read this and they kind of like poo poo it and say, ah, see, uh, Shravakas and intermediate Buddhas, they're really not that great. You know? Bodhisattvas are the really great ones. But then that takes away from the power of what Chandrakirti is doing here. He's basically listing out 
what to his audience is considered like the best of the best. So he says, the best of the best. And in fact, in, among his audience, there's a sense that it is so, so, so impossible to be fully awakened with this, that the most realistic thing for us to aim for is the intermediate with this and the shravakas. Now he says, intermediate with this and shravakas are born from the fully awakened with this. As, as in, because fully awakened with this have taught the Dharma, therefore, these two other types become possible. And then of course you will say, wait, didn't you say the intermediate with this? <laughs> do not need to rely on. So then here comes the commentary. It says, well, not in that lifetime. <laughs> of course, I mean, in the Buddhist system, this is not our only lifetime. It's lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of work. So somewhere along the way, they have also received instructions. And then, this is where it takes an interesting turn. You would think that, you know, it will stop there and say, therefore, homage to the fully awakened Buddhists, which is a legitimate, a proper, a, you know, no one can complain if Chandrakirti stops there and say that, therefore, homage to uh, the fully awakened all those who have fully awoken. But he continues. He says, but you know, where the Buddhas come from? Buddhas come from Buddhas to be, also known as, aka, Bodhisattvas. Without Bodhisattvas, there are no Buddhas. So Bodhisattvas give birth to Buddhas. Not in the sense of like a teachers of Buddhas per se, but rather a Buddha is a bodhisattva that has reached the fruit of its of, of his or her goal. Or its goal even is now Buddha. So now we are led to wow. So that's that's the effect that Chandakirti is, is striving is hoping, and like, wow, bodhisattvas. <laughs> How amazing. So now it's almost like saying, anything and all the things that are good in this world that have existed, that will ever exist and that are existing now, they come from bodhisattvas. <laughs> then again, if you're a Mahayana person, you're like, Yay, let's stop here. And he goes on. But where do bodhisattvas come from? Bodhisattva, so if you jump to the last line, these are the causes of the victor's heirs. The victor's heirs are bodhisattvas. That's just another way of talking about bodhisattvas. So then, where do bodhisattvas come from? Bodhisattvas come from these three elements. A compassionate mind, an understanding of non-duality, and bodhicitta. So here yet we have another group of three, which is slightly different from the three in the title of this retreat. The title of this retreat says, Metta, Karuna, and the uh, aspiration, the, the, the commitment, to wake up for the benefit of others, bodhicitta, are the three. Here is slightly different. It says compassionate mind. So that's the compassion. And understanding of non-duality, that's wisdom. Then the third, and bodhicitta, and here too, it's the commitment to wake up for the benefit of all. It says that these three are the causes of bodhisattvas. Not here, but elsewhere, 
uh, that logic that we were following, uh, Shravakas and intermediate Buddhists are born from fully awakened Buddhists. Fully awakened Buddhists come from Bodhisattvas. Where do Bodhisattvas come from? Elsewhere, it tells us, Bodhisattvas come from from where? No, 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 here, elsewhere. From the Buddha. From the Buddha. Bodhisattvas come from Confused beings. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you go, yay! <laughs> Bodhisattvas come from us. They don't fall from the sky. I was going to say the pure land. Yeah, from the pure land. No, from the impure land. Bodhisattvas come from us in two ways. One, us. We make the decision. We, in all of our confused ways, yet have somehow this mysterious capacity to aspire for the impossible. Or even to aspire for the ridiculous. <laughs> somehow. So don't put yourself down. You know? No matter how messed up you think you are. Don't put yourself down completely. Remember that in all the craziness, the darkness, the confusion, without, so let's say I say, okay, now I aspire to wake up for the benefit of all. But it's not possible for me to do it. if you all troublemakers don't exist. <laughs> you troublesome types don't exist. You annoying types don't exist. You inconvenient types don't exist. <laughs> so Shantideva takes that direction and says, you know, we are often so thankful to our spiritual guides, our teachers, our mentors, to the Buddhas, and we make offerings to them and say, oh, you, you, you taught us all this, you guide us this, you take us through all these problems and troubles, and thanks to you that I can get awakened, I can be free, you know. And he says, don't forget, equally kind to us, not based on the intention, but based on the effect, <laughs> equally kind to us, are uh, all sentient beings that we consider to be inconvenient, to be ridiculous, to be unreasonable, to be troublesome, to be a nuisance, or even to be enemies. Without them, how are you going to apply any of the teachings? Where are you going to cultivate patience? Where, where are you going to cultivate Maitri 4 and Karuna 4 if there weren't the objects of Maitri, of Metta, and of Karuna? So. That's another direction. But they're all pointing in the same place, a different route. So here, these three, compassionate mind, understanding of non-duality, and bodhicitta. Here bodhicitta, again, is the aspiration or the commitment to waking up for the good of all. And then as I say, this verse then takes to me to generally all the commentaries. Even I think Chandrakirti himself is commentary. He, he, he just 
takes this as another word for compassion. So we could, so maybe we could say, uh, love or compassion used interchangeably. Uh, here again, three. Buddhists really like three. <laughs> so the first three types of awakened ones, and then the three causes of bodhisattvas. Then here again, three. Why? Because it says, uh, love is the seed of this abundant harvest of Buddha, of being awake. So it's the seed, it's the cause. But not only that, love is also, or compassion, it seems like you know, used interchangeably, and compassion is also the water which causes growth and expansion. And then love also ripens into the state of lasting enjoyment. So love and compassion is at the beginning, is at the middle, and is at the end. It's the seed. It is also the conditions that will provide for that seed. And when that seed finally ripens and bear fruit, what are the fruits? Ta-da! It's also that. <laughs> so, when awakening is reached, It manifests as nothing other than love and compassion. But completely, kind of, you could say, pure, unobscured love and compassion is not possible until you arrive at that state. But you cannot arrive at that state without contrived and imperfect love and compassion, which is on all steps of the path. Yes, at the beginning stages of the path, uh, love and compassion can be painful. But if you recognize the, the final result, then that pain becomes meaningful. That you're willing to put up with, uh, because you know what the result is going to be. So as long as the cultivation of love and compassion is still on the path part, uh, it will involve varying degrees of kind of dukkha. The only love and compassion that is completely free from dukkha is at the fruit level, at the Buddha level. But this love and compassion is the seed, is the water, it's the fruit. It's where. And therefore, at the outset, I show praise and compassion. So now, love, and he switches to compassion. So clearly, for Zendakirti, he is uh, considering this as synonymous. So then, from that side, we can say that it is both love and compassion. That is the first part. The compassionate mind, actually here, would include both love and compassion. And therefore, at the outset, I praise compassion. That too should include loving kindness, metta, and karuna. And even if the words only have karuna, so now, of course, you're like, well, I think those two are just the same thing. Um, but again, uh, traditionally, the way it is kind of, uh, kind of uh, parsed out and kind of defined clearer, uh, it says that they are two different uh, kind of uh, qualities to cultivate. Uh, so the quality of metta, of goodwill, of kindness, or benevolence, or friendliness, mm. is said uh, so in uh, a formula that is repeated by uh, often in the Tibetan Buddhist traditions is what's known as the four immeasurables. Mm. And the first two immeasurables are the love and the compassion, the metta and the karuna. 
So there, there the words that define metta and karuna is, metta is uh, the wish for happiness and the causes of happiness. The wish for happiness and the causes of happiness. So that wish could be for ourselves and could be for others. And of course, it should be for both self and others. So metta is wishing, having good will, having, having good will, having uh, warm feelings for all, for others, for ourselves. That's metta. Then karuna is mm, the wishing uh, ourselves and others, but wishing to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. That's karuna. Wishing. Aspiration. Okay? Wishing, aspiring, whatever you want. Yeah. To be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. So in that way, those two are distinguished. They're not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And then, when we look at it that way, then there is clearly a sequence to these two practices. When, when they are put together like this, it's always start with metta. Start with loving kindness. Then, only then, cultivate karuna, compassion. Can we see why? Because you can't do one without the other. Well, if you can't do one without the other, you could reverse it. But here it's saying, no, don't reverse this. So why? The energy to think of the joy to uh, want to protect or sustain. Yeah. You have to find that happiness first. Otherwise, if you go to the compassion first, it will very easily bury you down, push you down. Mm -hmm. You're overwhelmed by suffering. Right now, a lot of people suffer from that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yes, for real, there are people that are suffering from, or will be suffering from, the consequences of actions taken by the powers to be. And then also there are those who are suffering because they are suffering the suffering of that suffering. Yeah. <laughs> that were picked up I think most of us in this room. You know, we, we're not exactly the immediate, uh, you know, end of some of these policies that certain groups want to put into law. But because we can, right? So then we suffer. So suffering is, is, is addictive and dangerous. So compassion, there's no, I think it's not a coincidence that we are so attracted to. But be careful, what are we attracted to? Is it the addiction of suffering that we are addicted to, that we immediately kind of like, you know, kind of gravitate that way? That's why it has to start with metta. Mm. And, and, and so here I want to say, let's pretend Chandakirti actually knows, has a reason for doing this. That even though he, he, he wants to talk about compassion, he starts with love. Because to effectively cultivate compassion, first you have to cultivate But you said he saw them as synonymous. Sorry? But you said he more or less was seeing them as synonymous. 
I said one view. Oh, I think you said that was his view. No, no, one view. Oh. Uh, yes. And I said, yes, even in his commentary, he seems to treat it that way. Yeah. Then I'm saying, let's play with this now. Okay. okay. So this is the whole theme of this weekend. We're going to play with this. <laughs> We're not going to get stuck in, well, exactly what is his view or not his view. We want to come at it from all these different directions. So let's take some liberty, some interpretive liberties here, and say, actually, maybe there's a reason that he doesn't even know. <gasps> Chandrakirti doesn't know. How do you know? <laughs> burn him, burn him at stake. <laughs> Heresy. You know? Well, it's like the four measurables with equanimity. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to feel the equanimity, uh -huh. even though it's the fourth one. Uh huh. Before you can, you know, you have to love everybody. You have to yes, love equally. everybody equally yes. before you can really yeah. love. Right. Or in the right way or in a skillful right way, way. And then yeah. have the compassion. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So here, uh, I think there is, a, there is a reason to read this as. No, they're not synonymous. And if you want to effectively cultivate compassion, start with metta. And I think I've mentioned this in the past. And here I'm going to be slightly controversial. Okay. Oops. Uh, some of the early masters in the Jigunka Yu, uh, the founder is Jiten Sungun. Actually this year we celebrate or we commemorate the 800th anniversary of his passing. So the celebration is in India this October, I'm going. Wow. But his teacher mm -hmm. uh, seemed to have been one of the figures that, that you know, say quite explicitly. And then, of course, he continued in that tradition, uh, which is, uh, and so it has come down to us uh, and says uh, be careful, be cautious when you do prayers uh, of taking on the suffering of others be very careful with that <laughs> that's basically sort of what people call Dongland Donglan meditation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That is a form of praying to take on other people's suffering. Actually, you know, Pamodrupa and then Jidin Sungun and then handed down within our lineage, we say, be careful with that. You know. Yes, of course. Uh, ultimately, bodhisattvas have to do that. But prematurely, it will lead to problems. I think it has something to do with our addiction to collect suffering. Hmm. We're attracted to Dongnen practice. I think that has a little bit to do with Jesus' baggage. <laughs> right? You grow up in a system that says the only one that can save you and the world for all eternity is one person. Now you have turned away from that. And, 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 and also you have said you know, that no one is worthy except for that person. Right? Now you come to a system that says you too can do it. <laughs> you can be Jesus-like. And then there's the baggage of like, well, Jesus died for all. So I should die for all. So there's, there's that like, you know, and then of course your reality is I can't die for all. And not, actually that maybe is not so problematic, but then you find yourselves as, no, I cannot even give you this parking space. <laughs> you know, and then you're like, you know, what kind of a jerk am I? You know, then it adds to this judgment, right? So then we're caught up in our baggage yeah. from a different tradition. This is what I mean by when we cross cultures, 
and we're not careful what we are taking, it could reinforce our flawed questions. That it's not answers that Buddhism is going to give you. If Buddhism or if Buddhist teachings is going to work, it should reformulate your questions. Because otherwise, you are feeding a different set of problems over here with Buddhist answers. You have to fundamentally change the way you think about what it is about, how, what is the mess, and how to get out of the mess. It's not that like becoming a savior figure. It's not. Buddhist compassion is not becoming a saviorist or a savior. It sounds so similar. Later we'll see, you know, there's nothing to save. <laughs> huh? <laughs> and that is the only way you can save. Or recycle. <laughs> Therefore, at the outset, I shall praise compassion. And I will bow down to for compassion, metta, So the schedule we have says that we're going to take a break now for lunch, and we'll reconvene at three o'clock. Uh, so we'll take a lunch break. At that point, we will begin the metta part uh, of this program. Thank you. Thank you. Press stop. Post. Press Stop and pause.